expertise on his national security team. He doesn't always agree with them, but he gets their best advice, and then he makes the decision. He's the commander-in-chief. You know, Just two quick political points. I think if you, if you look at where... President Obama's foreign policy is likely to crack wide open among partisan lines. This is it. This, 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 you will see uh, Senators McCain, I think, and, and Graham and others start to string together instances of America leading from behind and of this president's comfort in doing so in places like Libya and now in Syria. And, and I think this will become the most political part of the president's foreign policy. But we'll see policy. scrambling of party lines over yeah, here. Right, right. <laughs> but I think this is where he's opening himself mm -hmm. up to criticism of what, uh, what was a historically strong America, a strong role for America in the world, is being deteriorated by decisions like this. And I think that, like I said, the counter-terror policies are pretty much in line with what Bush and Cheney it, advocated. It's his foreign policy in, in, in this very complicated, very fragile I region. I say that. Where I think, and, and again, you, you know, you're going to see people parting with their own party, but I think Senators McCain and Graham and Chambliss and others are going to open up a line of In a attack. region that is changing rapidly, the United States needs to be seen to be on the side of people who are fighting for, for liberation, democracy. for democracy. And by the way, is the world really going to miss Bashar al-Assad? I mean, no. he, it'd be great if he was gone. And, a so, and, something, and he will go. something has to happen this year. I mean, that's the <clears> sense <throat> I got over there. Something has to happen. Either he is, he is gone or it's fragmented completely. People are so nervous over there in that region. I traveled to northern Israel and the Iron Dome, which is the missile intercept, that, that they're so nervous that Syria or Lebanon, more likely Lebanon, will start launching missiles towards Israel, that they've got these interceptors set up all over the northern border. And those chemical weapons, if I can just say, those chemical weapons, I was told, are now all consolidated in certain areas. They believe it was Assad and, and the Syrian regime so who helped they, Hezbollah get those, try to get those weapons out If in certain areas and Israel knows where they are, should we expect another strike from Israel? I, I think you very well will see another strike. If they do anything with those weapons, they said it's, it's easier to take them out, and it's not easy to take out chemical weapons than to send people in to safeguard them because it would take so well, many people. Again, remember, we went into, uh, were involved in Libya and weapons got out of Libya and we're dealing with them in Mali and other places now. At least those weren't American weapons, but we helped to stabilize the country. We've released them through the region. We ought to be pretty careful here. I couldn't agree more with you about Assad. I really couldn't. But again, I don't sense there's a lack of weapons uh, in the region. Well, and the rebels seem pretty resistance. well armed. Well, again, we agree on that. But yeah. here, be careful. And there are times when you do break with your, your advisors. Frankly, President Bush broke on the surge with almost all his advisors. I think he was right to do that. The president here, I think, is running risk. Now, the political risk is he owns it. I mean, you can't point to anybody else. I made this decision above people. That speaks well to him. About, I hope about now. to own is, again, um, Middle East policy more broadly. The president announced this week that he's going to go to Israel in March. You were there when the announcement came. What was the reaction and what is the, uh, the, the trip really about? And we were hearing from the White House, they don't really expect this to be the sign that the president is going to have a new peace plan on the table. It seems like it's largely about mending fen fences I, I, with I, Prime Minister Netanyahu. I think it probably is about mending fen fences. And in fact, I've never seen lower expectations. As soon as the <laughs> announcement was made, it's like nothing's really going to happen. We're, we're never going to get there. If you've talked to people on the street, and there's some people I've known there for 25 years who said, you know, nothing will happen, nothing ever has. And usually you get a little bit of a spark. Oh, the president is coming. Isn't that great? People were talking to me about, I said, oh, you know, you, the president's coming. And they said, oh, the traffic is going to be terrible. <laughs> that's New York City. <laughs> so that, that's where the expectations are on that. But I do think he needs to mend some fences with Netanyahu. It's, it, it's time that the president engaged over there. And, and in part because, you know, we, we still have this issue, Congressman Ellison, of the coming confrontation. Uh, with Iran. You've got two different messages from the Iranian leaders this week. The, the Supreme Leader says no direct talks. President Ahmadinejad today maybe said he might be open to it. But see, I think on that score, the president can't be uh, uh, criticized for not being in support of trying to make sure that Iran doesn't get a nuclear weapon. What I hope that happens is that the president uh, raises issues around uh, settlement expansion. <clears throat> I'm very concerned about it. Yeah, I mean, bottom line is, you know, after the U.N. vote, where the U.N. voted 138 to 9 to recognize Palestine as a state, there was housing settlements announced the next day, which was disappointing to me, in areas uh, that, uh, that, that were thought to be part of the Palestinian state. So I hope after the president leaves this time that there's no such announcement and nothing embarrassing happens.
Although I'm, I'm, I would be surprised if the president made a huge issue that as he steps foot into Israeli soil. Uh, look, I think that they're viewing this trip as, uh, you know, it's, it's our most important ally in the region. Uh, the president hasn't been there yet. It's an important trip. It's an important way for him to engage directly with the Israeli people, uh, first and foremost. Um, so I think that's the, through the, the lens through which they're looking at this trip. Whether expectations are low on the ground, <laughs> expectations, <laughs> and his, and keeping new, them lower is always a good thing. The new <laughs> team should be in place by then. Secretary Kerry started this week. Secretary of State Kerry, Senator Hagel, still waiting for his confirmation up in the Senate. And I was struck last night, you were talking about Dick Cheney uh, earlier. Dick Cheney giving a speech last night in Wyoming where he really took off on the president's appointments. Let's put it up here right now. Uh, he said that the performance now of Barack Obama as he staffs up the national security team for the second term is dismal. What he has appointed are second-rate people. Hagel was chosen because Obama wants to have a Republican that he can use to take the heat for what he plans to do to the Department of Defense. There is an unbowed Dick Cheney. Well, listen, uh, Senator Hagel didn't do his new boss, President Obama, any favors by looking befuddled and confused and totally clueless about what exactly the Department of Defense does, an agency where he's up to now run. So I, I don't think Senator Hagel did himself any favors or the president. But I, I think that when you look at how Republicans have, have sort of stood back, and I think given the president a lot of running room on foreign policy, it was because of a belief that Secretary Clinton, Secretary Gates were incredibly competent and incredibly reasonable and, and really um, quite measured in their foreign policy worldview. There's trepidation that the coalition of Senator Kerry, Senator Hagel, and a sort of uh, uh, renewed um, former Senator Biden are going to have a, a, a much more left-leaning well, foreign policy. Senator Kerry approved overwhelmingly, but, but, but speak to this issue of, of, of Senator Hagel right now. The White House was not trying to defend his performance before the committee, but they're still pretty confident he's going to get confirmed. Well, look, for and I love that Stephanie Cutter has to defend <laughs> Senator Hagel I'm just, I'm so, and, and Jay Carney, who was a, a White House a correspondent during the Bush years, covering Senator Hagel. It makes me so happy. This is my karma. Look here. Senator Hagel. I love Senator so Hagel. Right right <laughs> um, look, first of all, let me address Dick Cheney. Uh, I think the worst thing that we could do right now is take Dick Cheney's advice on foreign policy. So that's number one. Number two, John Kerry comes to this job with so much experience, life experience, both on the job as the chair of the Foreign Relations Committee. He has been an ambassador all over this world on behalf of President Obama, bringing, you know, conflicts on the ground to an end uh, and representing this country uh, in a strong way, a balanced way and a diplomatic way. And I think that, uh, you know, his becoming Secretary of sign of strength for this administration and is being celebrated all over the world. Senator Hagel? Senator Hagel. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no. Now, uh, putting aside his performance at a, a, you know, a committee hearing, which will have nothing to do with how he performs his job as Secretary of Defense, he also comes to this position with a significant experience, both as an enlisted man, as a senator, um, and, and has strong support across the board. Uh, in being able to do this job, including from Republicans. You know, what happened that day in the hearing, putting aside his performance, there was a lot of grudges being settled, uh, a lot of personal conflicts being worked out, had very little to do with current foreign policy. For God's sakes, uh, Afghanistan was barely even mentioned. It was all about the surge in Iraq. That is dealing with I, old uh, wounds and not, I not Stephanie something needs that we to need to come back and be Hagel's communication. <laughs> <right>. <laughs> 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 we we know what we're, we're running <laughs> afraid. Thank have you, but no. <laughs> in the Obama administration, LaHood, Gates, Hagel. Absolutely. We're trying to do the right thing for the country, not score political. We're, we're, we're out of time. Right? So does right. anybody think he's not going to get confirmed? He's going, to oh, he's going to be confirmed, right. absolutely. Thank you all very much. It was a great roundtable. Stephanie's going to stick around to answer your Facebook questions for this week's Web Extra. And coming up, best-selling author George Saunders getting so much buzz over his latest book, 10th of December. He joins us next. This week with George Stephanopoulos. Brought to you by Charles Schwab. Seems like ETFs are everywhere these days. But there is one source with a wealth of ETF knowledge all in one place. Introducing Schwab ETF OneSource. It's OneSource with the most commission-free ETFs. OneSource with ETFs from leading providers. And extensive coverage of major asset classes. All brought to you by one firm with comprehensive education, tools, and personal guidance to help you find ETFs that may be right for you. Schwab ETF OneSource. 
For the most commission-free ETFs, you only need one source and one place. Start trading commission-free with Schwab ETF One Source. Call, click, or visit today. Investors should carefully consider information contained in the prospectus, including investment objectives, risks,